I'm going to be talking to you today about election coalitions. Um, who knows what an election coalition is? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, so at the end of this, you should, uh, hopefully. <laughs> but just to explain my background a little bit, I'm the news and information credibility lead at Google. Um, I uh, make grants to the news ecosystem, people tackling global misinformation, and also support product teams at Google to think about misinformation in different ways. Um, and uh, pri prior to Google, I was working at Full Fact. I was deputy CEO at Full Fact, the UK's independent fact-checking charity, um, and I've been in the civic tech space for some time. It's um, a different experience for me to be here as a Googler and not as someone in a nonprofit. Um, so uh, that's uh, one for me to think about later. Um, election coalitions, what are they? Um, today I'm going to walk you through a short history of election coalitions. Um, this election coalitions research project that uh, me and my colleagues have put together. Um, talk to you a little bit about the formation and organization of them, some of the lessons learned, and some case studies. Um, let's get going. Election coalitions are essentially uh, when you have a series of organizations come together during an election, usually media, fact-checking organizations, or civic organizations, to share resources in some meaningful way um, to make sure that the outputs of fact-checking or the research that's done around an election goes the furthest. Um, so the first example of this was election land in 2016 where a bunch of uh, universities and media organizations got together and started to pool their resources on fact-checking. Um, that meant all of the monitoring efforts, uh, students would find monitoring uh, uh, pieces of misinformation to actually check, um, and then that would be handed over to trained journalists that would actually check them, and then several media organizations together would publish the outputs. So instead of one organization publishing a series of articles, you would share the outputs of that. Um, in a, under, under the new brand election land. That kind of model kicked off um, in a, quite a good way and led to many more different examples of that around the world. Um, some of them we will go into later, but just to give you an idea of how it kicked off, I made a little timeline for myself. In 2017, after election land, there was cross-check in France. Uh, then there was Comprova in Brazil in 2018 and Verificado in Mexico. Uh, in 2019, there was Objective Disinfo in France and Reverso in Argentina. So already, like, in the next four years, we have four or five really big examples of election coalitions coming together. In 2022, in the Philippines, there was Facts First PH that was spearheaded by Rappler. Um, and that kind of took it to another level, um, which I will talk about in a bit more detail in a bit. Um, but that's essentially the, um, the premise, is media organizations and fact checkers, uh, and in some cases civic organizations coming together to pool resources and make the most of election misinformation. For this research project, we um, wanted to understand of all of the ones that had come before, um, what are the, how have they worked, what are the lessons learned from all of them, what can we kind of extrapolate for future election coalitions. Um, so we uh, interviewed 13 experts who supported eight coalitions around the world. And some of the things we wanted to understand uh, was uh, best practice um, and also what makes a successful election coalition. Because some of them didn't do so well and some of them really, really flourished and changed uh, the way that lots of people voted in a country. Um, so it was really important to understand actually what made a good one and what didn't. The six key learnings that came out of uh, this work, actually I'm just going to go to the next slide, some of the lessons learned, <laughs> and then we'll go into the, the more deeper one, was that preparation is really key. Starting early and planning for scale um, was really, really important because in an election, as you will know, having worked on elections probably at some point, something can go from nothing to something very, very quickly, and it can grow very, very large especially when you've got huge media organizations involved, launching a branded uh, fact-checking or misinformation endeavor can grow very fast. Um, so preparing for that scale is very important. Um, also understanding the context in which you are playing is very important. Um, so it's not um, 
enough to just have the same kind of one-size-fits-all approach for all election coalitions, but understanding the specific social context or political context of your own country is very, very important in understanding the scope. Um, and finally, diversity and collaboration was uh, key. Um, Facts First PH kind of widened the model of election coalitions to more than just media organizations and started including legal communities, academics, civil society, and social influencers as well. And that kind of took it up another level. I'm gonna totally change the order in which I talk about everything because I think it's more interesting. Um, and instead talk about this case study first. <laughs> um, so Facts First PH, uh, was a cooperation of more than 100 organizations, 131 to be exact, um, in the 2022 Philippine presidential election. Um, there were 1,422 fact checks released as of November uh, 2023, which is a substantial number, <laughs> um, especially during election and for 131 partners. The really interesting thing that these guys did was introduce this kind of idea of the many different uh, positive actors in the space when you think about an election. So lots of the other election coalitions were thinking about what is the right authoritative information we need to put out into the world and then just putting it out into the world and hoping for the best. Um, the, in the Philippines, they kind of introduced a whole bunch of other layers on top, which um, I think is really important to thinking about the misinformation challenge. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking to you about that. So it's not enough to just put out authoritative information into the world. Uh, you need to identify where there are data voids or where there are like harmful gaps and rapidly changing context, identify them and then, you know, with the media organizations, experts, fact checkers, fill those gaps. But I think on top of that, it's really important that you have this thing that they called the mesh layer. You have research and you also have accountability. So the mesh layer was a series of organizations that don't necessarily create the authoritative information, but do amplify it because they're very trusted in their own communities. Um, and these were things, these were people like community organizations, NGOs, influencers, in some case, the cases, the fact checkers themselves had really big following so they could act as the mesh layer. A good example of that is an organization called Amna.org. Uh, it's a trusted intermediary for refugees around the world. They would take the misinformation or the UNHCR information and repurpose it to their own communities where they had very high trust. Um, again, it's not enough to just amplify the good information. You also need this research layer on top um, and actually understanding at scale what are the global narratives that are trending um, and actually understanding what is the more medium and long-term view we should be taking on these issues. Um, and so. Uh, things like the Global Disinformation Index assess like the risk in media markets around the world and identify like how much money is being made from disinformation. And you can only do that when you take a big step back and kind of see uh, the insights at scale. And then finally, once you have the authoritative information, you're amplifying it, you've got some research um, right at the very top. I think it's really important that more organizations and election coalitions think about this what is the actual change that you want in the world? What is the long-term sustainable thing um, that you're aiming towards? Um, and uh, in uh, some of these cases, um, in the Facts First PH coalition, they actually ended up getting lawyers involved in the, civil, in the actual coalition. Um, and those lawyers would be looking for uh, like legal changes that they could be making in the country's um, uh, laws uh, to actually uh, make sure that these types of uh, errors or data voids or harms didn't exist in the same way in the future. Um, a good example of the whole thing working um, is um, I think Bellingcat or people like um, Witness um, who uh, during conflicts, for example, um, identify authoritative information from people on the ground during war zones or conflicts that might be identified to them and amplified via communities. And then they might actually use that evidence that they collect to um, uh, hold people accountable in, in international criminal courts uh, for war crimes. So I think when we talk about misinformation, we sometimes get stuck at this bit, but I think we need to think about the top bit as well.
So that was Facts First PH doing something kind of magical. Um, and uh, some quotes from Gemma, who was the head of research and strategy that I, I quite like. Um, she says, uh, we saw the need for a support system for journalists on newsrooms that are being harassed or even people who are supporting them who are being harassed online because of their involvement in this effort. Um, I think it really points to an important, um, uh, important thing for around these election coalitions um, that it's not enough to just put out good information. You also have to make sure that you're safeguarding the people who are actually involved in these efforts because a lot of the time it's at the risk of themselves that they're doing this work in the first place. Some other case studies. Uh, Comprova in Brazil had 24 partners. Uh, they received 78,000 uh, files through WhatsApp channels to check and they ended up publishing 1,750 um, articles together. Um, and reached about 7 million people. Um, Daniel Bramati says, in the last five years, we trained hundreds of journalists and the feedback we have is amazing. People say to us that I'm now a better professional because of Comprova. And I think that points to a really important part of these election coalitions, that it has a lot of capacity building for all the media organizations involved. Um, Cross-Check France, um, how much, five minutes, great, thanks. Cross-Check France, 37 partners and thousands of articles and social media posts related to presidential campaigns. Oh, sorry, hundreds coming in. Uh, they had about 1.2 million video views in total across Facebook. Um, and Gregoire Lemachand says, this is one of the biggest wins in AFP history. Cross-Check will always be very special personally. Sometimes I meet colleagues who took part in this project and they say, do you remember Cross-Check? That was so great. Um, and I think it points to a couple of these learnings that we've pointed out in the report. Um, it's really important if you're setting up an election coalition that you identify the specific need in that country. Um, why, why does it need to happen? Why do you need to pull resources? What is the best way of actually building that? Um, identifying the lead organization is very, very key. It has to be um, someone who's very respected and considered neutral in that specific political context, which could be hard, but I think it's very important. I think it's really also important to cover quite a large political uh, scope when you're inviting people to be part of that coalition as well. Um, in terms of the membership, um, understanding exactly what is helpful for that specific country's context is it just media organizations and fact checkers? Is it broader in terms of civil society? Would you go even further and include social influences? That kind of thing. Um, and in terms of capacity building, you can spend a lot of time talking about this bit, but actually the most important thing that comes out of these election coalitions is that it builds trust across organizations. Um, and it builds trust ac across organizations that are pretty huge. Um, and I think that that's really important. Um, and uh, I'll also add that one of the really important things, I think, for me personally, is that um, these election coalitions um, share resources, they pull the outputs, they pull the learnings, but also because of the trust that it's building, it leads to long-term sustainability and cooperation across media organizations. So although it spins up for just an election, some of them have ended up changing the landscape of media in their countries by turning into associations or turning into relationships across newsrooms that people then continue outside of the election. So instead of just fact-checking in one media organization and then someone replicating that effort six times over in other news organizations, they're starting to pull resources in a way that actually means everyone can do a bit more. Um, so thinking about that long-term approach is actually very important. And I think that trust building is the key thing that we get out of this. I'm gonna leave it there. I feel like I've thrown a lot of information at you, but um, everything is very neatly uh, in this report. Um, so that will do a better job at explaining it than I can. You can find it at tinyurl.com election dash playbook. And there's also a little podcast that came out recently with Claire Wardle and, um, and Gregoire um, with uh, Katie Harbuff at Anchor Change. Um, who will explain it in even better detail than I can. Um, but thank you very much for listening.